Welcome back to GTR. My name is Mark, and this is the Board Game Throwback Show, where we take a look at the top 10 games for a specific year on Board Game Geek. And we ask ourselves, hey, would we play these today? All right, today on Board Game Throwback, we're taking a look at the year 1969. That's right, 1969. If you would afford me just a few a few brief moments of your time. If you direct your attention to the screen above me, you'll see that I just so happen to be at GTR's Instagram page. You can find us there at Game to Remember. Uh, at the time of this recording, we are at 311 followers. And do you know what? Do you know what? We'd absolutely love to have you as the next one. Our arms are wide open and embracing and accepting. Come on in and join the GTR family. Uh, 1969 was a very iconic year in modern history. Many uh, influential things happened in that year. For example, Apollo 11 lands on the moon. Uh, in music, the Beatles release Abbey Road. Uh, also in music... Woodstock, a festival, a music festival established in a small farm in upstate New York is created. And over 350,000 people are in attendance. The mind, uh, the mind boggles. Also in 1969, for us baseball fans, the inaugural season of the Montreal Expos is uh, premiered in 1969. And also, and finally, the big yellow bird. Big bird. Uh, Sesame Street makes its debut in 1969. So with all that said, uh, the board games that are released in 1969 have some big, iconic shoes to fill. Will the board games live up to these expectations? Let's find out. All right, without any further ado, uh, as per usual, I'll fire up Board Game Geek, do an advanced search on the year uh, 1969, sort by current uh, rating on the BGG list, open up the first 10 entries, uh, and start at number 10 and work our way up. So, let's take a look at number 10. Okay, <laughs> we have... 1960, uh, sorry, sorry, in 1969, we have Hang On Harvey. Guide your man down a wall without falling to the bottom. Uh, and I just want to point out that uh, we have entered the bowels of BGG uh, ranks. Uh, we are at 13,669 overall on the Board Game Geek game list. That doesn't bode well for them. I mean, this is the 10th. So, I mean, we're going to go up from here. But, I mean, we're down there. We're down there in the the depths. Uh, this is for two players. It's 10 minutes, ages 6 and up. And it's 1.2 on the complexity scale. This was designed by Perry Grant, Ruman Klamer, Klamer, and Harvey Hank Kramer. Published by Ideal or Korea Board Games. Okay. Uh, the the object of the game is to be the first player to get any part of his Harvey to hang below. To get any part of his Harvey to hang below the bottom edge of the playing field. Players simultaneously race each other in lowering their Harvey by removing one peg from the playing field and placing it somewhere below Harvey so that when you remove another peg, Harvey will fall onto your other remaining pegs. Uh, if your Harvey falls all the way to the bottom, then you have to start again from the top. Beginner plays with uh, Beginners play with four pegs while advancing... Sorry, beginners play with four pegs while advanced players use three. So I think you're playing simultaneously and you have these pegs and you're lowering your Harvey. Uh, hang on, Harvey. Hang on, old bud. So interestingly enough, I'm okay. So these kind of stick all the way through here. So he kind of, I'm guessing that as you remove these pegs, he'll swing 
right? So, you know, if you remove this one, he'll swing downward on his leg or uh, you're putting one in here to support him and then you remove his arm. That's kind of cool. I mean, that's not nearly as uh, terrible as I expected. It's it's kind of like that... Uh, that uh, what is that game with the tube and the marbles and the sticks and you got to pull those out? It it must. It, that's not Plinko. That's the Price is Right game. Um, anyways, that seems kind of interesting. For oh, let's see this picture. <laughs> okay, I mean, so it's this. Uh, this is kind of pretty normal for this time, I guess. Um, you have this kind of acrylic plastic game, and you guys are on both sides of it. Uh, I'm reminded here of Battleship type thing. Um, so that's that's kind of neat. I don't know how well that would work with this guy uh, falling down and then him falling off, and you got to kind of start over. Uh, but I, it, this is just a racing dexterity game that I'm sure would have been uh, fun if you were this age in the 1960s uh, and wanted to play a board game. Uh, would I play this game today? Sure. I would. If I found this somewhere, it's probably worth something. But if I found this, I'd absolutely play it with my kid. It'd be fun. Uh, the, they don't make games quite like this anymore. I mean... Why would they? Uh, anyways, that's number 10. Uh, hang on, Harvey. Number nine. Number nine is Origins of World War One. So, um, surprisingly, we have another war game. Origins of World War One. you negotiate with other players to achieve your list of national objectives. Uh, it's ranked 13,068 overall and 2,420 on the war list. It's for three to five players, 60 minutes, ages 12 and up, and 2.43 out of five on the complexity scale. This was designed by Jim Dunnigan and published by Dover Publications. Uh, Origins of World War I is a war game, a uh, political print-and-play war game on World War I with alliances, auction bidding, dice rolling, negotiation, ratio combat results table with variable player powers. Ages of World War I appears in Sid Saxon's well-known game book, A Gamut of Games. Gameplay is very si similar to Origins of World War II. Ooh, which was published by the Avalon Hill Game Company in 1971. Uh, the Avalon Hill Game Company, I am just seeing over and over and over again. I feel like I need to do a deep dive on the history of the Avalon Hill Game Company uh, because they are just everywhere in these old board game throwback series. Uh, I am so intrigued by these guys to see what they, who they are and where they are now. Uh, Although pro players have to provide their own game components. What? The following description was taken from a gamut of games. A political strategy game in which five players uh, represent the five major nations in pre-World War I Europe. They must compete against each other to achieve each nation's national objectives. While actual war is not allowed in the game, the play should show quite clearly how tensions developed to such a high pitch in 1914. A full set of rules and print and play components are available for download in the file sections below. Interesting. Um, it's a uh, print and play from the 19... I can't... Okay, so... Um, very interesting in terms of what this is. Wow. Look at this. It looks kind of... Jim Dunnigan's Origins of World War One. Uh, I am in uncharted territory. I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't even know if this is a board game. <laughs> Maybe this is just a history lesson or something. Uh, I okay. Well, here look, this looks. This is a game. This is a game. Hmm. Uh, this is. A, I'm kind of fascinated and speechless at the moment. I, I'm not even sure what entirely this is in terms of a game. Negotiate with other players to achieve your list of that. Uh, I, I'm at a loss. I don't know what you do here. Uh, there's 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure what this is. Um, but <laughs> that's number nine, Origins of World War One. All right, number eight is uh, Wu Sing. Uh, no description, ranked 10,928 overall, 447 on the abstract list. Okay. So this is for two to four players, 30 minutes, ages 10 and up, and 2.33 out of 5 of the complexity scale. Uh, an alternate name this might go by is Domino Bead Game. This was designed by Sid Saxon and published by CEJI. Uh, the, the first thing that catches my eye with this is that it's an abstract strategy game for two to four players. Um, that's interesting because most abstract strategy games think chess, right? Uh, chess or checkers or something of that nature uh, where it's just a board with pieces and you're moving them. And there's generally no theme and there's no nothing other than just movement and placement restrictions. Uh, but, and those are generally for two players only. So the fact that it's two to four players, that's intriguing. I'd be curious how to know how you play that. Uh, it says here that it's best for two. Uh, so this is a published version of Saxon's Domino Bead Game as described in a gamut of games. Uh, okay, so this is the second time now we're hearing about this gamut of games. That might be interesting to do a series on. To find this, maybe go through that and see what it's like. Eh, it could be interesting. It says it's a domino-like placement game which rewards the appropriate arrangement of patterns. So domino-like, so you've got these pieces with, these colored pieces with, I don't know, those people or shapes. Uh, so I guess if you're lining them up, there must be some sort of bonus, like these blue ones here and these tan ones here. I'm trying to see a pattern there. I, mean, I don't quite know what what you'd place there. Uh, interesting. That's number uh, eight. Wu Sing, an abstract strategy game for two to four players. All right, number seven. We have... Oh, another war game. Are you surprised? We got Barbarossa. Barbarossa. The Russo-German War from 1941 to 1945. Classic mini monster East Front game with operational overtones. Wow. <laughs> uh, two players, 360 minutes, ages 14 and up, weight 2.57 out of 5 on the complexity scale. This is ranked 10,750 overall and 2,107 on the war list. That seems that it's not a not really regarded as a great war game today. It was designed by Jim Dunnigan, and it was published by SPI. Uh, okay, interesting. I already see a ton of little square pieces, which is very reminiscent of these old war games. Uh, so nothing new under the sun here, but let's see. On June 22nd, before dawn, German tanks and guns began firing across the Russian border. It was the beginning of Hitler's Operation Barbaro Barbarossa. Bar Barbarossa. I, I don't know how to pronounce that word. One of the most brutal campaigns in history of warfare. Four years later, the victorious Red Army has suffered a loss of 7 million lives. The Barbarossa campaign included some of the greatest episodes in military history. The futile attack on Moscow in the winter of 1941-1942. The siege of Stalingrad. The great Russian offensive beginning in 1944 that would lead the Red Army to the historic meeting with the Americans at the Elbe and on to victory in Berlin. Barbarossa is not simply one game, but is composed of three different types of games. One, the standard games. There are four of these games. They depict the specific situations or crucial parts of the war. The campaign game. It combines four aforementioned games and fill in the gaps so that the campaign can be played out in sequence. The variable situations. Several what-if historical effects are examined when added to the above games. The game includes a 23 by 29 inch map that portrays the areas of the Soviet Union in which the operations took place. A hexagonal grid is superimposed upon the map to regularize the movement and the position of the plane pieces. 
Wow. How to play. Each player moves his units and executes attacks in turn. Players have um, players have as an objective to destroy the enemy units and gaining territory whilst maximizing friendly unit losses. The combat's resolved by comparing attack and defense strengths of adjacent opposing units and expressing the comparison as simplified probability ratio, also known as odds. <laughs> Each game turn is composed of a two-player turns that are divided into three uh, phases. So this is a World War II war game with dice rolling, hexagon grid, ratio combat results tables, simulations, and zone of control mechanisms. Uh, yeah. Would I play this? No. <laughs> uh, I'm not overly interested in this, and I haven't been in any of these old old war games and as they get older in time they look less appealing to me uh wow look at that just map cool i mean it looks great so fascinating to see some of this old oh, man could you imagine in 1969 playing this wow that's very interesting it's a cool look. It's a nice little looking map. I wouldn't be opposed to playing something that looked like that today. It's nothing fancy, but I'm okay with that. I like that. Uh, that's cool. Uh, okay, so that's that's number seven. Barbarossa, the Ru the Russo German War, 1941-1945. All right, number six. Number. Uh, six. Ooh. <laughs> what is this? This is Play Boss. Uh, 9,920 overall, three to nine players, 180 minutes, ages 16 and up. Oh, my goodness. Wait, two and a half out of five on the complexity scale. Uh, I am not sure what this is. This cover is potentially misleading. Play Boss. This is an economic industry manufacturing negotiation game with auction bidding, commodity speculation, simulation, and trading. Wow! I was not expecting that. I was thinking this was going somewhere else. Playboss is an exciting board game that simulates the many real-life business situation in which directors and managers make their decisions. Each player in this game is a businessman who has the opportunity of buying machines and raw materials, selling his products, paying taxes, raising loans, or introducing rationalization schemes, and generally experiencing the ups and downs of everyday business life. Before starting, players agree the duration of the game. <laughs> Interesting. Never. Okay. The player with the greatest net assets at the end of the game is the winner. The board comprises of a circuit of 42 spaces of five different types. Decision spaces on which the player can choose to buy raw materials, purchase capital equipment, manufacture goods, or sell goods. Research and development risk spaces which allow investment for productivity, improvement, or risk reduction. Risk spaces which require the drawing of a risk card. Additional cost spaces and depreciation spaces. Each player has a factory card on which are placed machines, computers, raw materials, and finished goods. At the start of the game, price slots in the center of the board are filled with goods. These slots are emptied and filled as goods are brought in as raw materials and sold as finished goods. The buying and selling price is determined by the next available filled or empty slots through, uh, through players can bid competitively for the purchase or sale. Uh, this economy game uses the basic mechanism and many features. Um... This is sounding very cool, and the first thing I'm thinking of is Power Grid. Uh, now, Power Grid is, okay, This if I see this cover, that makes me think a little less provocative and a little more uh, economic game. So uh, the f the f when I think of a market speculation, I think of Power Grid, and I love Power Grid, and I love market speculation in a game. This seems uh, now it's hard to knock it based on look alone uh, and this is kind of the first game that I'm seeing that resembles a tabletop board game and this I can't I can't look at it on statics alone because that's that's it's not gonna look the best obviously uh, but I will say that I th personally, I think, okay, here we, okay, I think that a game from the 1960s that 
had to do with economics and market speculation was probably pretty intense. Probably pretty cool. Uh, There was probably a lot of luck involved. I don't know what this track is, but there was probably some luck uh, because of those old like Monopoly where you just roll and move around the board. I don't know what all you do, but uh, I, I just have a feeling that based on some of the old games that I've played in the past, uh, if I think of uh, masterpiece or careers, um, there was a lot of decision making and a lot of stuff that could be had there. Uh, so I think that this could be pretty interesting. I would absolutely uh, play this game. I would absolutely play this game today. I would add it to my collection of old games of Monopoly and uh, Careers and and uh, Masterpiece and some of these some of these old. I would absolutely play this. Because market speculation are, is my absolute favorite type of game. Uh, and so I would just love to add this to the repertoire and just say that I've, I've played this. Uh, this would absolutely be something that I would keep an eye out for. If I, was in a, uh, if I was in a flea market or a store and saw this, come across this, absolutely would, would pick it up. That's number six, Play Boss. All right, number five. We're halfway through the list. Number five is Monad. Monad. Ranked 4,000, sorry, ranked 5,400 overall and 259 on the abstract list. No description. Two to four players, 45 to 60 minutes, ages 10 and up, and weight 2.03 out of 5 on the complexity scale. An alternative name for this is Die 1 Million. Okay, designer Sid Saxon. Oh, okay, so he he's also designed another game on this list that we saw that Wu or Wu Sing game. Yeah, so he also published this game. Uh, so he also apparently pu- published in 1969 Monad, uh, and this was published by 3M or Eagle Griffin Games. This is a abstract card game with ladder climbing and sec collection. Interesting. I'm not sure what the ladder climbing is. The object of the game is to collect round cards known as monads, which look like yin-yang symbols. The players do this by trading, buying, and leaping with other cards. Monad, or Die One Million, uses a deck of cards with six colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. Half of these called, uh, sorry, half of these are called warm colors, red, orange, and yellow, and the other cool, green, blue, and purple. The majority of cards have one symbol on them known as commons, but there's one card of each color with two to five colors on them known as bi, tries, quads, and quints. Okay, this seems intriguing. At the start of the game, each player is assigned one of the six colors as their identity and is dealt six commons and one bonus card, which shows the three pairs of colors. The buys, tries, quads, and quints are placed face up in a separate pile in the center of the table. Cool. On their turn, a player attempts to get higher numbered cards into their hand. The easiest way is by trading. To trade, a player turns in a pair of cards with the same number of symbols but opposite colors, one warm and one cool, and takes the top card from the stack with the next highest number of symbols. When they turn into quints, or sorry, when they turn in two quints, they gain a monad. If two If the two cards turned in match one of the pairs on the bonus card, they may also draw the top card from each of the lower stacks. They may also use cards of the same color as their identity as wild cards, which are treated as having any number of symbols. The player that can move... The player uh, can turn in more than two cards and leap to a higher stack. This allows them to select a card with a higher number of symbols. Finally, they can buy a card. Buying card uses the numbers located on each card. The player turns in a number of cards with the total greater than the number of the card they are after. Monads can be purchased for 80 points. Hmm. A player can also draw the top card from the deck, but doing so prevents them from taking any other action that turn. The first player to accumulate a given number of monads, which varies depending on the number of players in the game, is the winner. And this was an award. This was an SPJ recommendation in 87. Wow, 87. 60, 70, 80, almost 20 years, 18 years after it was first published. 
That's interesting. So, and I mean, what I know about the Spiel des Jahres would be it must have been republished or reprinted or re uh, maybe by this one, Die One Million, in in eighty seven, so that it could be recommended then. That's my guess, anyways. I don't. I would don't know. I'd have to research that. Uh, this seems pretty cool. Uh, I like deck games. I like card games. And this is interesting. Uh, this is interesting. Mona has an extremely unusual game of skill, which requires advanced planning as players trade, buy, or leap their way from the commons to the monads. Uh, cool. I, I mean, just going to throw it out there right now. I would totally play this. I would totally play this. I feel like I would love this. This feels like it it checks the boxes in terms of what I would look look for in a game. Uh, not not the perfect game, but I, I would absolutely play this. Uh, it, it does seem a little convoluted with the colors, the buys, the tries, and this and that, and the primary, the warm and the cools, and then your identity color. Um, that's cool. It just seemed maybe a little convoluted. I feel I would have to play the game. I'd have to play the game or see it to to really understand what they're talking about, about leaping the decks or these piles and whatnot. But this is cool, and I, as a lover of of graphic design and whatnot, I, I'll make a commentary on this cover. The, I really like that for the old '60s and '70s designs. I mean, that's that's just so cool. This old looking artwork, like why? It's cool because why is it that? What is that? Why was it designed that way? It doesn't make any sense. And I love that. Uh, that's cool. Bonus. Like, why was it chosen to design it this way? And I'm guessing, like, and obviously, limitations of of the medium back then, right? Limits and determines what you can design. But uh, the, the limitation of that makes it so cool in terms of well, you would never have a card that just says bonus vertically this, and it's so hard to read. Um, and those colors don't look well together, but I understand that it's probably the warm and the cool colors together. And I don't know. This must be what you can take. Uh, that's cool. Oh, it looks kind of like a book. Uh, okay, so this is a, finally in English. A strategic action game of buying and trading. That, oh yeah, I'm right on board with this one. Right on board with this. And there's a lot of pictures for this. On here, which leads me to believe that it's still relative, relatively attainable, or it, it kind of circulating somewhere, or someone just had a bunch of pictures that they put up. But this is cool. I think we're. I think we've left the realm of of Monad here, or maybe this is that other game, Die One Million. Okay, so this I, this looks like what what have, might have been released in eighty seven. And maybe that's what was maybe that was what was uh, uh, nominated for the SPJ. So that's number five, Monad, uh, and we would totally play this today. I want to play this today. I want to see this. I would love to touch and hold that box. Uh, that seems very uh, cool. I I would absolutely play this game. I think it I think it looks fantastic. So that's number five, Monad. Okay, number four, we have uh, Bowling Solitaire, a novel solitaire game scored like real bowling. This is ranked 5,214 overall and 1,258 on the family scale. This is for one player's, obviously, it's a solitaire game, 30 minutes, ages 8 and up, weight 1.5 out of 5 on the complexity scale. Designed by who else? The old Sid Sid Saxon himself published Dover Publications. Sid was on a rip in 1969. Uh, Bowling Solitaire was designed by Sid Saxon and published on his A Gamut of Games. According to him, he created this game because of his distaste for solitaire games in which a red 9 is placed on a black 10. Oh, controversial. In this game, standard playing cards are used to simulate a round of bowling. Okay, so that's cool. Uh, I wonder how... What can we see here? 
a standard deck of cards. This seems pretty cool. This seems really cool. I would like to know how to play this. Let's indulge me for a second. Let's click on this. And let's click on this. And let's see. Oh, Sid. How's she going, bud? Uh, Sid was born in 1920. Until 2002, he was a significant American board game designer, collector, and writer. At the time of his death, the Chicago-born game designer had a collection of over 18,000 games. And he was also known as an exceptional dancer. A good game should be easy to learn, yet have an infinite strategic possibilities, giving you the chance to make choices, create interaction among players, and takes a maximum of one and a half hours to play. Sid Saxon. Ah, Cool. A bridge list with notable games. Uh, Choir in 1964. Bazaar in 1967. 1980. Uh, he had Can't Stop. And in 1994, he had I'm the Boss. Uh, cool. So he was ripping uh, games in 1969 here. Oh, look at this. So, so there's Monad that we just looked at. Venture, high finance and big business in old New York. Sleuth, solve the mystery of missing Gems, and I will say that based on this cover art, I need this sleuth game. Look at that, that looks absolutely gorgeous, and so does this venture game. I love that picture of the city. Uh, I need to do some research on this, and so I know we all, well, obviously we just looked at we're looking at Monad. I uh, know we, we just looked at Monad, and this is uh cool. And, uh, sleuth. Oh, I like this a lot. I gotta do some. I gotta do some research on that. To see what we're looking at, and maybe we'll find it here in the gamut of games by Sid Saxon. Oh, cool! This book offers rules of thirty-eight games that are playable with ordinary gaming equipment: cards, dice, and a checker set, pen and paper. The games in this book covered a wide variety of topics and skill levels, including the game of strategy, chance, and logic. A full list of games that appear in the book include. Wow. Wow. Very, very neat. Cutting corners, paper boxing, hold that line, focus, color gin, bowling solitaire here, card baseball. Oh, this is interesting. I know we've diver- we've diverged here down the path of something else, but this is cool. And as someone that is interested in old board games, hey, oh, the Avalon Hill Company. Ah, cool. We're into it now, buds. Uh, the Avalon Hill Company, February 11th, 1969. Mr. Sid Saxon, we are gratified to know that you wish to include the Avalon Hill game line in your op- upcoming publication. Cool. Very, very interesting. Uh, for one, I am I love history. Anything to do with old, old, uh, anything that's old, I absolutely adore history. So, uh, I am just geeking right out here. Look at this: a gamut of games by Sid Saxon. Uh, Oh, man. Imagine you can have this. I'm sure you can find the publication somewhere. Uh, And there seems to be a lot of cool games that you could play. Uh, And the idea being that you you just need typical gaming things, such as maybe some dominoes, some cards, some dice, a piece of paper, and a pencil. And you could have a good time. Uh, that's cool. And you know what we're going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to find out how to get a hold of this. And we're going to do some, we're going to do some research and some playthroughs on some of the games from a gamut of games. Uh, and one thing that I would like to play is, is bowling solitaire. Uh, really cool. Just, I'm, I'm really just fascinated right now by this. And that's, that's number, uh, four. Bowling Solitaire. Okay, number three is 
Venture. Oh, <laughs> cool. Uh, so we, we're seeing some correlations and some crossovers here. So this is the game that we just looked at here by Sid Saxon. Uh, that's also in the same publication as that Sleuth game, as well as this, uh, what was it called? Monads. Uh, this is ranked 3,613 overall and 1,431 on the strategy list uh there's no description two to six players 45 minutes ages 10 and up 197 out of five on the complexity scale not designed by who else but the old sid saxon himself and uh 3m in the avalon hill game and eagle griffin games oh huh. so this is venture which i had said just a moment ago that i would do some research on and would you would you know it here we are so this is a strategy card game an economic card game with set collection card uh, card game in which players purchase companies using sets that have various monetary denominations turning in a set with matching symbols is worth more than the face value of the card so set collecting becomes a key strategy uh, so that reminds me of like bonanza right where where set collections the more you get the more they're valued uh, purchase companies or the corporation cards are placed in front of the player according to the matching letter system the top company of each stack is vulnerable to proxy takeovers by other players so they usually attempt to order their holdings such that the most valuable ones are covered by less valuable companies the scoring occurs whenever a player draws a profit card from the deck. The game ends when the corporation deck is exhausted. Originally published by 3M, republished by Avalon Hill in its Game At line, when they took over 3M's line, Schmidt published the German edition Die Bose. I don't speak German, so sorry. Uh, in 1991. Oh, that just sounds so cool. Uh, you know, this whole court, this whole economic strategy of the set collection and then the top company each stack is vulnerable to proxy so you can probably steal it so they're they cover up the higher valued ones with these that whole thematic tie to that just seems really cool to me that seems so cool well look at this i am absolutely enamored by this Oh, look at the back of these cards. I don't know if that's textured or just the print. I think that's like a texture. Oh, this is so, so cool. Oh, I am just, I am coveting this right now. As a lover of, of history, as a lover of board games, and a lover of old things, this game and Mona and the, the Sleuth one, which I wonder if that's number two or one, but I am just fangirling out so hard right now like i have like of all of the of all of the board game throwbacks that we've done so far i have never coveted or <laughs> lost it after something uh, like i have for these games this just looks so cool it looks so good uh even of nothing else but then to just be displayed oh these guys know what's going on they got their hands on it and they're playing it uh i absolutely love that it's a card game that has economics and uh, some good strategy. That's going to check every box for me. Uh, look at this. Gorgeous. Uh, that's number three, Venture. Number two is Anzio. Oh, we're back on the war game. We're, we're, we've derailed here from my fangirl crush of <laughs> these other card games. And we've entered back into the world of... Uh, war. Uh, this is Anzio, World War II's Italian campaign classic. Plays quick, has plenty of what ifs. This is ranked uh, 3,596 overall and 592 on the war list. For two players, 120 minutes, 12 and up, 3.24 on the complexity scale. Designed by Tom Olson and David Williams and published by, if you don't know yet, you haven't been watching, the Avalon Hill Game Company. Uh, before we go any farther, does this look familiar? <laughs> Every war game uh, released 20, 30 years ago. 20, 30, 40 years ago. But, uh, cool nonetheless. So this is a World War II war game with dice rolling, grid movement, hex grid movement, point scenario mission campaign. What more is there to say? Uh, but in... Anzio, uh, few games have been kept up to date as much as Anzio has. Revised and revised again. A good game has gotten better and better. Played on a 44 by 14 inch map 
of Italy, the game recreates the Allied amphibious invasions and campaigns to secure the peninsula, leading to the heart of Europe. The Allies face not only the German and Italian armies, but some of the most varied terrain in the world. The 24-page rulebook is divided into a basic game and several advanced versions, each advanced version adding more and more rules, complicating while making the game more realistic and adding the feel of the actual problems, decisions, and actions of campaign. Um, so the Avalon Hill complexity rating is 4, and the advanced games go anywhere between 7 and 10. And I think when we've looked at Avalon Hill complexity ratings in the past on these previous games, sorry, uh, I think the highest we've seen is 9. So this is clearly can start pretty low at 4 and goes up to, to 10 with the various strategies or the various uh, uh, advanced games that you can add in onto this. So, again, uh, just a classic war game. This I like this map, though. I like this better than most maps that we've seen. But, man, is that busy. Man, is that busy. Uh, in, I, I wouldn't... I'm sure if you were into war games, this would just look pretty cool. Uh, I love Italy. I'd love to go there someday. So I'm interested on that front. And, I mean, just what is this? What is this? I mean, the world of, of war board gaming is so fascinating. Uh, I've researched and come across so many that I just feel like I have to play the game now. Or I have to play a war game. I, f I feel like it's a must at this point. I'm, I'm missing on something, perhaps. Um, uh, this is it's cool. It looks... It looks fine. It looks intense. Uh, it looks big, uh, and and like like the all the other war games that we've seen. Uh, but that's number two, Anzio. All right, and we've reached the top of the list. Number one from 1969, uh, and we have none other than lines of action. Be the first to connect all of your pieces by moving them along their lines of action. This is ranked 3,196 overall. And wow, 77 on the abstract list. It's for two to player, two players, uh, 20 minutes, 10 and up, 2.71 out of 5 with a complexity rating. This was designed by Cloud Soci and published by Dover Publications. Hmm. Okay, cool. I, uh, uh, that looks neat, the little picture there. Uh, so an abstract strategy game with grid movement, pattern building, and static capture. Uh, so that would uh, must be something to do like checkers or chess where you're uh, moving on this board and you're capturing your opponent's pieces. So in Lines of Action is a simple game that uses checkers, board, and pieces. Okay. Uh, if rules are published in... Uh, Sid Saxon's a, a gamut of games. There are some commercial versions available, though. Uh, okay, so this would be, you know, as we've learned in Sid Saxon's gamut of games, this would be a game that he designed um, or that he uh, at least published that you could play with just a board of checkers. So it's kind of sounding like he was taking these old games and kind of putting a spin on them, making... He was making expansions back in the 60s. You know, he was just... He was taking control here, taking these games and uh, and revamping them. That's cool. This Sid Bud is seems pretty neat. Uh, so again, there are some commercial uh, versions available. So it's probably um, just like similar to Checkers, but but some maybe some uh, unique components. The object of LOA or line of sights to get all your pieces into a single connected group. A group of pieces is connected if they occupy an unbroken chain of adjacent spaces, horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. Uh, and then an SPJ recommendation in 88. Very cool. I would love to know more about how this plays. Um, oh, wow. Lines of action on an old Windows XP uh, window here. I never have seen that on an old machine. So, I mean, this is cool. I, I'm, I'm imagining that you could go somewhere right now and find this online. Uh, and learn how to play it. So you've got this. I can see where if you're using a checkerboard and you'd, you'd set up on both sides. That's very uh, unique and very uh, like eccentric for this guy to be thinking of how to reinvent existing games and make it uh, different or, or change up 
how to play a game that you already own and make it different. That's so cool. Very, very cool. Very commendable. Uh, not something that you would see now. You would just get a new Kickstarter f- game funded and uh, spend a bunch of money on a bunch of pieces. Uh, I digress. But very cool. Very cool. Interesting little abstract game. I wonder what this picture is. Lines of action. Uh, that looks. That looks. Oh, that looks just neat. That looks very neat. Uh, I would be absolutely curious to play that, and I would play it for sure. Uh, and uh, I've gained a newfound love and appreciation for this Sid Saxon bud. Uh, and I think, uh, stay tuned to our channel to if this interests you at all. It interests me uh, to research this uh, Sid Saxon designer and his gamut of games, and kind of see what. Uh, how we as modern tabletop board gamers can p- perhaps use some of these as tools to introduce the hobby to others. And, you know, maybe we can uh, take some of these and keep them in our tool belt as things we can whip out to say, oh, you've played checkers before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait for this. Let's do this and I'll blow your mind. I mean, that's what I'm kind of thinking is the premise of this whole lines of action, at least. And uh, that's something that I'm very interested in in doing compiling this list so if that if that interests you be sure to stay tuned for that and then also stay tuned for the next episode of board game throwback next thursday where we take a look at who knows you'll have to wait and see thanks for tuning in guys until next time peace (laughs) 